And so, uh, David, we love you and, and thank you for being here. And you and your wife, Lisa, and David pastored many decades in Florida, um, um, many years, not many years ago, but some years ago. And um, so I, 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 like, I like that experience. I like diversity. And, and one more thing that I was fits into this little uh, puzzle, the little speech puzzle I'm doing here, is the scripture says that, uh, you know, you have very many teachers, New Testament. They were being admonished as a church, a first century church, that you have very many teachers, but very few fathers. There's a difference between teaching something and living something. In other words, a life message. I don't have things to teach. It's not about teaching. My teaching is just a, it's a life message. And fathers usually and mothers have a message. It's not a teaching. It's something they live, not something they teach. Teaching happens to be just the off draft of something they live. And that is the most powerful. And uh, so I believe that, and I believe that's what David carries. And so, David, we welcome you and, uh, as a father in that sense. And, uh, and, uh, and go for it. You know? Um, my brother and sister-in-law, you might want to bring this down a little bit. Um, I can almost guarantee that. Um, thank you. My brother and sister-in-law live in the house that my parents owned. Uh, they still live there. Uh, my mom died a few years ago, and they uh, took over the house. And my sister-in-law sent some pictures uh, in the email yesterday, and uh, we were looking through those as a family, and there were a lot of pictures, at, was particularly with me as a little boy, um, where my hairline was about right here. And um, anyway, it made me think about something that my parents were always telling me when I was a little boy, which was this. And I can hear the exact tone of voice. I can hear them saying it, and this is what they would say. David, everything is not a joke. So um, you can imagine why they would say that to someone. Um, anyway, so I would say something funny right now, but I was just hearing my parents' voice in my mind this morning saying everything is not a joke. So you already know that I'm funny, right? <laughs> so I don't, need to, I don't need to prove it. Okay. Well, um, let me just jump into Isaiah. How do you like that for a segue? <laughs> um, you don't need to turn there, but it's from Isaiah 43, and it says this. Remember, this verse 18. Remember ye not the former things. Neither consider the things of old. Verse 19, Behold, I will do a new thing. Look at your neighbor and say, thing. thing. Don't you hate it when people do that? Now it shall spring forth. And here's a key phrase in this passage. Shall you not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. And I just want to say something at the outset, that I, and, I, and I mean this, this is not a joke. I mean this in all sincerity. I am thankful for a pastor who understands this truth. I am thankful for a pastor who understands this truth, knows how to proclaim it, and has done so for a long time. As I was thinking on this thought, Yesterday, I reached behind me in, at my desk to my bookshelf, and I said, yeah, I've got a book that he wrote on it called The Coming Shift. And then I, 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 I found another book that he wrote called Spirit Talk, Hearing the Voice of God. And I thought, that, what a treasure trove that we have here at Paytonsville. By the way, there's no kickbacks to me if you order any of these books from... Sorry. <laughs> Everything's not a joke. Um, but I, I, I just want to say, Larry, how much I appreciate it. It's truly a big part of the reason that I'm here. Because I know that you understand that. And we are living, as I say almost every time I speak, because I can't help it, we're living in a time of transition. 
And it's a big transition, everyone. And big transitions, you lose sight of that you're in a transition. Little transitions, you make the transition and you can see the whole thing front to back. Big transitions, you can't always see. And you, and you, you become like a fish in water as a person in a transition of ages that are happening in the earth today. And I'm here to declare in all confidence and by the Spirit that we are living in a time when God is doing a new thing. And, and, and I know because I've sat where you are and amen and yeehawed that message until we get to the part where it says, don't remember what you did before. And we don't like that part. Because we are, we're creatures of habit. We have a tendency to look back in order to find the way forward. And that's good. It's useful. It's helpful. It's instructional to look back. But you can't always find the way forward by looking back. Sometimes you have to look up to find the way forward. So, um, in, in Luke chapter 11... One of the disciples asked Jesus, he sa they said, Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us, how, how do we pray? What do we desire? That's really what a prayer is. It's, it's, it's communicating a desire heavenward, isn't it? Prayer. Teach us how to pray. And this is what Jesus said. You know what his words were there. Some of the most famous in all of Scripture. When you pray, say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. This is the New King James. Your kingdom come. I pause. Your will be done. This is what I want you to desire, boys. I want you to desire that His will will be done in the earth as it is in heaven. That's what he taught them to desire. That's what he taught them to pray. The question is, how can we know what his will is? And there's many layers and many applications of that idea of what his will is. It starts out personally and it expands out to the whole world. So there's a lot of levels of His will that, there, that, there, uh, that exist for us to be able to um, come to know. So I propose to you that if we are to desire His will that's done as it's done in heaven, that we should have a view of what His will is that's happening in heaven. Makes perfect sense to me. So, steal a thought from Larry. If we're going to go into some new things, how many of you believe that God is doing a new thing? Can I just see your hand? I'm a teacher. How many of you are excited by that prospect? Okay. So, here's some wisdom from Pastor Larry. That if we're on a train going sort of spiritually west, young man, if we're going to go west, young man, it would help if we had a track, wouldn't it? Because the, the, the activity and expression of the Spirit could be likened to the train, but the, the, scripture, the Scripture is what keeps that experiential uh, stuff on track. So if we're going to go into some new places and some new things that we've never seen before, into some territories that we've never experienced before, it would be very useful if we had a track, wouldn't it? And, and the track, Larry says it this way, we have the train and we have the track. We have the spirit and we have the scripture. We have the pneuma and we have the graphe or the grama, the written word. I'm in a charismatic church, I can tell. Because as soon as I start emphasizing the scripture, we get a little tepid in our response. Just saying, 
I'm, I'm as sensitive as can be right now, so careful what you think. <laughs> Just kidding. So, does this make a logical sense? We're going to some new places because God's doing a new thing, and in order to be safe and not end up in a ditch on fire, it would help if we have a track that's going to take us somewhere, wouldn't it? And the scripture is the track. And let me tell you, in case you think that the scripture is old and old news, you haven't any idea what's contained within it. If there's any sense that this is old and boring and yesterday's news, let me just encourage you, friend, there are more layers for you to discover. Are you with me? I've had some of the most... Uh, profound moments of my life sitting, studying at, at, at my desk. When I was a younger man and didn't have a desk, it was at the dining table, sitting there and, and, and saying across the room to my wife, I am overflowing with the Holy Spirit right now, doing nothing but just studying, just studying and feeling an, an overflow out of my innermost being because the spirit that wrote these words is also the same spirit that lives in me. And when we get those things mingled together and start mixing a, a, an apothecary, as the, as the scripture talks about, a holy anointing oil, when that begins to happen within us, something begins to happen that is frankly hard to describe. Amen. So please, if you have... If you have if you're not interested in the scripture, even if you've come from a tradition where that's all that the diet was and there was very little experiential reality to your spiritual life, even if that's what you're coming out of, don't let go of the scripture. Let the spirit infuse into the word the life that is really already there. So let's lay some track. So we're talking about God doing a new thing. We're talking about his will being done in the earth as it is in heaven. And if we're going to desire and be instrumental in bringing about, and by the way, how many of you feel like we're supposed to be instrumental in bringing about the will of God in the earth? How many, let me see your hand. So it'd be good if we had a glimpse of what that will was in heaven, wouldn't it? All right. Hey, page two. So I want, if you have your Bible, you can turn to Genesis 28. If you don't, you can just listen. And this is the story of Jacob's ladder. And this is the first, really what I believe to be the first mention of the idea of an open heaven in the scripture. And so I'm applying some principles of interpretation to the reading of this word, which is, that if it's the law of first mention, there must be some guiding principles contained in this story that are going to help me to interpret the rest of the scripture faithfully. Did that make sense? Listen, everybody. No one but no one is interested in my private interpretation. And they're certainly not interested in yours. And we need to be careful that we aren't coming up with private interpretations of the Scripture. Because the Scriptures don't need to be interpreted by your natural mind into your own private interpretation. He has already provided a means, as I have uh, enumerated, of the Spirit that dwells in us that can interpret these Scriptures faithfully. But we have to be dedicated to that process. Okay, so law first mentioned. So here we go. Jacob went out from Beersheba and went to Haran. The context is he is in a transition in his life. He has been a Jacob, he has been a deceiver, and he has deceived, and he's also gained a blessing out of it, and he's transitioning out from being the deceiver into something else. And so what we have here, he came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set, and he took one of the stones of that place and put it at his head, and he lay down in that place to sleep. Then he dreamed, and behold... A ladder. Pausing here. 
a ladder was set up on the earth. Aren't you glad that it's set up on the earth? Aren't you glad that this, la this ladder is set up right in range of your foot? It's set up on the earth right where we dwell. And its top, even more glorious, reached to heaven. So here's how I read this. God is showing Jacob something what he's showing him is, I am going to make an access, uh, I'm going to give you access from the earth into heaven, and I'm going to provide the means for you to, to go from that earthly realm up into the heavenly realm. I'm going to, I'm, he saw a ladder set up on the earth, its top reached to heaven, and there the angels of God were ascending and descending. Everyone say, ascending and descending. You got to go up before you have anything worthwhile to bring down. Listen, I'll tell you one of the reasons why the world is in chaos right now, because no one but no one knows what to do. I don't mean the church. Only partially do I mean the church. Everyone is trying to figure it out. Some with more or less scruples and morals than others. Everyone's trying to figure out what to do. All right, and behold, the, the Lord stood above it and said, I'm the Lord your God. I really don't want to read all of these verses because he, he gives him a blessing. And it's a tremendous blessing, and it's important, but I don't have time. Jump down to verse 16. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. I'm telling you, there's a law of first mention here that's very vital for us to understand. The Lord can be someplace, and we don't know it. I want to suggest to you that that's a good part of our day. I'm not going to preach. I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. And this is the... Wait, wait. <laughs> Thank you, you're right. <laughs> Audio visual. There's only one reason for a gate, everyone, and it's not to look pretty. It's not to stay closed all the time. If you want it closed all the time, just don't make an opening and it'll be closed all the time. But a gate speaks of access. It's an access point. This is the access point of heaven. God is showing me. This is why he, was, he awoke from his sleep and he, he said, surely the Lord is... He was afraid. He was in awe. God is showing him something. That there is a means by which you can go from the earthly realm into the heavenlies, and you can ascend and descend. And he even has messengers who, whose very purpose is to stand by to do his bidding in the earth, the angelic realm. What a dream. What a dream. The gate of heaven. Now, I want to read to you from Job, the oldest, reported the oldest writing in the scripture. And this is from chapter 33, and it says, wait, let me, let me just set it up a little bit. 
You say, David, are you saying that God has placed a ladder in front of me down here where I dwell in order for me to climb up that ladder and access the invisible realm of the heavenlies while I'm still living on the earth and see what his will is and then come back down that ladder and carry out that will to, the, to, to whatever sphere of authority he has placed in my life? Is that what you're saying? Yes, that's what I'm saying then why do we not know what to do at times? Why do we not know? And if you've ever had children, there are times in the developmental stages of your children that as a parent, you don't really, if the truth be told, you don't know exactly how to handle this situation. And, you know, fill in the blanks with the situation that you don't know how to deal with. I've got five children. It's my own fault. <laughs> I love my children. They're the joy of my wife's and my life. But you see, in Isaiah, he said, I will do a new thing. Shall you not know it? And then I talked about Jesus teaching them to pray that the will that, w- that is done in heaven would be done on earth. But how can we know it? And, and Jacob says, the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. The issue is not the access. The issue is the knowing. And that's what we're laying some track for today. Everybody? This is not just some theoretical message. The idea is to go west. Let's go west. Let's go into some new area that has never been seen before. And listen, listen, lest you're worried, the last thing I want is something new, quote unquote, that is not his will. That's the absolute last thing I want. I'd rather some old than some wrong new. Because at least I know what the old was. Are you with me? So the issue is knowing Y'all okay? So Job 33 says this. Such an important verse, or a passage of scripture. So important. Highlight it. Put an asterisk by it. For God speaks once. Yea, twice. God is speaking. And he'll speak to you once. And he'll speak to you again because you know why? He loves you and he wants to be your father and he wants to help you and he wants to guide you. And so if you didn't get it the first time, he'll say it again. With long suffering. With mercy that's new every morning. God speaks once, yea, twice. Listen, yet man, God is speaking. Get the picture. Think of it like radio waves coming from heaven. Just just visualize. God is broadcasting, transmitting, and man perceives it not. Did you know that right now there are invisible communications happening in this room? Just relax, it's not weird. I'm talking about radio waves. People still have radios, right? Okay, just making sure it's not all streaming. Okay, and if I were to take a little radio out of my back pocket, which I'm not, but I should have thought of that, and I turn it on and I pull up the antenna and I dial in, everybody say, dial in. And I dial into the frequency, the wavelength, which I've talked about in this room at great length, <laughs> length, wavelength. Uh, and we t- dial into those frequencies, that wavelength, 
You know what that little speaker on that radio is going to do? It's going to start sounding in our hearing the communication that we know nothing about that's actually happening all around us. God speaks once, yea, twice, yet man is not dialed in to the frequency on which God is transmitting. You know why? I'll tell you why. I know a lot about this. You know why I know a lot about it? Because I'm 59. And I've been living here for 59 years being distracted into something other than the voice of God. I'll tell you how it happens for me at 59, so you young people just check out for a second. All the old people, you can identify, and people way older than me, you can go, Sonny boy, just wait. <laughs> I wake up, and the first thing usually that happens is, well, first of all, it's not morning. It's a long time until morning, when the first time I wake up. The, I used to wake up, and it's morning, or hey, mid-morning. But now I wake up and it's pitch dark and my eyes go to the clock to just see. <laughs> and then I assess, listen, I'm kidding, but I'm not. My mind, listen, checks in to a time-space continuum. I look at the clock. You say, that's what you're doing? You're checking into a time-space continuum? Yeah, when you check out what time it is, that's what you're doing. Try going to a foreign country where the clock doesn't mean much, and you'll understand. We here are pretty time-conscious. So, and then I start to go, I, I, I assess my carcass. You know, that part's hurting right now. I must have been laying on that for a wrong way or something. You see, I'm kidding, but that, what happens is our minds, our thoughts, listen carefully, our thoughts are drawn into a physical consciousness, awareness. It's a better word. And I get up, I get up, and I, and I ask myself, am I, am, I gonna, am I all right? Am I dizzy? Or when I put my foot down, I go, are those bones okay? I put all my weight on that foot as I'm transitioning. I'm, am I okay? And what happens, listen, and then I wake up and I see, and then I start, th or maybe it happens before my feet hit the bed, I'm thinking about all of the activities, or maybe I think uh, I'm hungry or I need to relieve myself, or I'm all of these things that draw us into the outer world. Are you okay with me saying outer world? Is that okay? You all right with that? Does that sound weird? The scripture talks about the inner man, does it not? So there must be an outer one. Okay. So what does God do in this case with these men, these men and women who, when I'm speaking, are dialed into the wrong frequency or their doggone radio's off? Well, I'll give them a dream then. Because you know what's not working when you're dreaming, when you're asleep? Your conscious mind. So God says, I'll speak to them in a dream. And what does God do? In a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls upon men and slumberings upon the bed, then he openeth the ears of men and seals their instruction. Are y'all okay? I don't know. I don't feel like you're okay. You're okay? So one of the reasons that we don't know the will of God, the will of heaven, we don't know his will as it's done in heaven, is because we are so preoccupied with the, the physical realm. You say, well, David, what do you want us to do? We're living in a physical realm. I understand that. But we might alter our focus some, and it might help. I heard this dear old lady on YouTube, she was like in her 90s, and she was just in that dear little older lady way saying, I spend the first five minutes when I wake up talking to the Lord. Now, chances are most of you already do this. You don't look at the clock. 
You don't assess your carcass. You don't see if you're dizzy. You don't think about your day. You probably already do this. I, on the other hand, am a heathen. And my mind goes right to controlling my atmosphere. The business manager at a place where I worked once said, once said she, was a, she was from Brooklyn. She was about six feet tall. She was from Brooklyn, and she said, you're a control freak, Mr. Skinner. <laughs> so... So maybe if we spent that first five minutes of the first moment we wake and we turn our hearts to the realm of the Spirit, we turn our hearts to our Father who is invisible. Do you know, I don't know about you, but do you know what I mean by when I say twilight? When you have awakened a little bit, but you're not fully engaged in the terra firma, and you're in that in-between I am more receptive to the voice of God in that twilight time. Anybody, raise your hand if you've experienced that, just out of curiosity, okay? So, what we're talking about is, well, you know what we're talking about. So, let me briefly give you some other scriptural references of times when heaven was opened. Mark chapter 1, verse 9, And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from, Naz- came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in Jordan, and straightway, coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opened, and the Spirit, like a dove, descending upon him. And there came a voice from heaven, saying, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. It's a very familiar passage you all know, and you may be thinking, Well, yeah, that's fine, David. Jacob, that's so far back there, we can't even, who even knows? Jesus is the Messiah. We don't, he has access to things that we don't have access to. Oh, is that right? He can do things, when he, when he was here as a man, he could do things that we will never be able to do. Oh, is that right? But let me just tell you this. Here's a biblical example of what happened when the heavens opened. But I want to tell you, the heavens usually don't open in this profound kind of experience just for kicks, just to give you something to do for the afternoon. Often it is at a transitional time in the life of the person who receives the the experience and the vision of the open heavens. It's a time of transition. Oh, wait a minute. We talked about that earlier in the message. Are we at a time of transition? Could be that this could be needful right now. Have you ever in your own natural humanity said, this world is messed up? Hard to see how it's going to get straightened out without some pretty bad pain. How many of you have said that? I believe there's a remedy. I believe it with all my heart and soul. And and we are part of the remedy. All right, so you didn't like it when the heavens opened for Jesus. How about this? Acts chapter 7, verse 54. When they heard these things, what were the things? Stephen preaching them, reviling them in his preaching. He he took those Jewish leaders, and he took them to task, and they didn't like it not one bit. And when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, listen, being full of the Holy Ghost... My dad used to say when I was a little kid, you might have gotten filled at one point, but you might have leaked out some. There are times when I'm so full of the Spirit, you could hardly do anything to offend me. I'm just, honestly, I I mean this in all sincerity, I'm, I'm flying high spiritually. And there are other times it has leaked out. And it doesn't take much to offend me. Just look at me slightly the wrong way. Just say something with a slight tone of voice and I will pick it up. So he was full of the Holy Ghost, first of all. First of all, he was full of the Holy Ghost. 
How can you be full of the Holy Ghost? I don't have time to talk about it, but there are means. There are, everyone listen, there are rungs on the ladder. And they start from the earth level. I'm no good, rotten, dirty, sinful, evil. There's still a rung. Just saying. But he was, it says he was full of the Holy Ghost and he looked up steadfastly. That means nothing, not even angry Jewish leaders who are ticked off that you have just, you know, indicted them with your message and they, they have a history of killing people like the prophets, which he had just told them about, that all your ancestors did, right? And he was looking up steadfast. He was full of the Holy Ghost, and he was looking up steadfastly. I'm looking up physically, but I don't think it was a physical looking that he was doing, because I don't think you can see past the sky much, unless you got really good eyes. And even then, not going to help. And he, he looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God. You see, that's why I say it wasn't, it wasn't this kind of look. Maybe he was looking up. It's fine. I look up. It's fine. But up to me is down to somebody on the other side of the planet, by the way. Just saying. Not to mess up your theology, but it's a realm. It's a dimension. I'm not trying to take anything, but I'm just trying to say this is an experience of a person living on the earth who was looking into the heavens in a dangerous spot. And he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, he said what was happening just to rub it in. You evil person, you are reviling all us and all of our ancestors and making us look bad. And now he said, I see the heavens opened. Uh, maybe he didn't say it that way. Probably not. I see, but that's what he was seeing. He's very clear. And the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. And when they heard that, they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears. What a bunch of babies. And ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet. Very, very significant set of circumstances to a man whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen. And what was he doing? While they were stoning him, he was still focused on God in the heavens. He was because he was looking steadfastly up. And he said, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. You see, this experience was not just so he could brag about it in heaven after he got stoned by them. It was, it was actually, even at the very end of his life, it was producing the fruit of the spiritual life. Man, I can't even take a good insult much less a bunch of angry Sanhedrin throwing stones big enough to kill me. And he says, Lord, don't lay this sin to their account. Sounds very much like Jesus on the cross. And when he said this, he fell on sleep. There are other examples, but I'm just giving you those two. Now, I want to turn quickly... I'm so frustrated because this is such a wonderful passage and I want to do the whole two chapters, but there is not a chance. It's Acts chapter 10. This is the story where Cornelius, who is a, 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 a Roman centurion, but is a faithful man. He gives alms. You know, all, you've read, read the description. If you haven't, read Acts chapter 10. And because of those things that he was doing, though he was a Gentile... He had a visitation, and the visitation instructed him what to do. Send men, right? And at the same time, what I love so much about this story is that it is a divine intersection that neither of them had any awareness that the other one was happening while it was happening. 
Do you see? That's the greatness of our God. If we will align ourselves with his will, heaven's will for us in any given moment, he will intersect us with other people who are having a similar kind of experience and things will get exponentially greater. Say, Lord, I need you to do all these things with all these other people. You don't need to worry about any other people. You just take care of your own self. So I can't read it, but I want to jump in. This is Acts 10 and starting in verse 9. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh into the city, that's the people that Cornelius sent, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour, that's about noon. Why the housetop? It was a place of privacy. And he became very hungry and would have eaten. But they weren't ready. The food wasn't ready. Are you kidding me? You mean we're Christians? Because the food wasn't ready? Uh, sorry, that was a little leap there that maybe you're not ready to take. Uh, it will, it'll become apparent. He went up to pray because they weren't ready to, with lunch. And what is he doing? He's not surfing the internet. He's not making small talk. He's praying at the sixth hour. But while they made ready, listen to this, he fell into a trance. And all the weird people are like, yes. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Not really. That was a lie. He fell into a trance. L let me just say what it is. The, the Greek word there is ecstasis. And we get from that Greek word, the English word, ecstasy. Now, just hold on. It carries the idea of being in a state where one's normal mental faculties are suspended. Do you remember I said we wake up and our mental faculties engage with the terra firma? Well, in this case, as he was praying... As he was praying, as he was praying, he fell into a trance. You know, I've heard that if you have someone come and speak at your church on prayer and you announce it, that people won't come. That's what I heard in a lot of places. If I started the message by saying, we're going to do a lesson on prayer, everyone would have been, Inwardly, not everyone, but you know, there's a couple. But it would have been like, great. You're going to tell us what the Bible says about prayer. Okay, but he fell into a trance. Let me read you something else that might give you a little bit more illumination if I can. Just a second, let me, I captured it with my screen capture. And it says, Although he is awake, his mind is drawn off from all surrounding objects and wholly fixed on things divine that he sees nothing but the forms and images lying within and thinks that he perceives with his bodily eyes and ears realities shown him by God. That's what a trance is like. Lord willing... I'm going to share some experience, a couple of experiences that I've had with you. Because I don't want it to be theoretical only. I want it, I want it and, and I love process. You know, Will, the other night, you talk, Larry was talking about opening the door, and, and then he went into this thing, and you're like, wait, wait a second. Describe that. Mine is probably not as lofty as Larry's, but I'm going to describe some of the process surrounding. Okay? Is that fair enough? I hear someone thinking, Myrtle, as soon as he starts the trance bit, we're out of here. 
Okay, Orlo. All right. He fell into a trance and saw heaven opened. And a certain vessel descending to him as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts. All manner. The clean kind, the unclean kind. All manner of four-footed beasts on the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And there came a voice. Isn't it interesting that it just says it like that? There came a voice to him. That's what it says, isn't it? That's what it says in my translation. There came a voice to him and said... There came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, the funniest script statement in all of Scripture, not so, Lord. Isn't that kind of an oxymoron? You're my Lord, but no. We do it all the time. Go say you're sorry to the person who just offended you. Not so, Lord. I want you to dig a little deeper when you give to this uh, person that you know is in need. Not for tax write-off, directly. I want you to give them some money out of your bank account, and I want it to be significant so that it helps her, and I want you to give it, and nobody's going to know, and you're not going to get any credit for it, and I want you to dig deep. Not so, Lord. And we go into accounting. Right? We do it all the time. We think, oh, Peter, what what a jerk. But we do it all the time. Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again, You see, you see, this is our Father. He says it again. No, I can't receive that, Lord. I've, my whole life I've never done this. Can't receive that. Nope. I cast you out, you demon. And he says a second time, what God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. This was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. Three times he said it. Now while Peter doubted, oh, please start this way. When you have a spiritual experience that absolutely arrests your consciousness, please Don't make a YouTube video immediately after. Start by doubting what it means. It's awfully quiet in here. Did you know that Paul said, I knew a man in Christ, he was talking about himself, but you have to see the context, he was trying to brag without bragging because they were bragging, and he was trying to show them the foolishness of bragging, and I don't want to brag, but I'm going to brag just to show you all. You know that part? And he says, I know a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot cannot tell, God knoweth such an one caught up to the third heaven. Later on in the passage, he refers to that as paradise. First of all, if you're having profound, trance-like experiences on the regular, doubt it even more. I'm, I'm kidding, but I'm not. That's funny, but it's not. Paul said, 14 years ago I had an experience like this. You don't need this kind of profound experience all the time. Some people open the sock drawer and they're like, Lord, which socks should I wear today? And they fall into a trance and he shows them where the blue ones Y'all are a little mad at me right now. It's okay. I taught high school for many, many years. I can can take the heat. (laughs) Now, while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. And called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, were lodged there. 
And while Peter thought on the vision, he's still thinking, he's doubting, he's still thinking, what was this? God is making it, literally making a divine intersection happen exactly at that moment. And the Spirit said unto him, notice that there is a, 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 a delineation, a difference made, if you will, in the trance-like experience and what he's experiencing now, which is what? The Spirit speaking to him. Are you with me? Behold, three men seek thee. This is the Spirit speaking. Arise, therefore, and get thee down, and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Now, I learned this from Pastor Larry. Sorry to keep stealing Larry stuff, but, you know, you quote it two or three times, then it's yours, okay? So I'm quoting Larry. No, I'm just kidding. Larry talks about three phases of this revelatory experience. Number one is the receiving of the revelation, number one. Number two is the interpretation Number three is the application of it. What, what is it, the, the revelation, what does it mean, and what am I supposed to do with it? And this is a classic, perfect template for that right here, right in those verses that I just read you. The revelation was the trance, the sheet let down with all the clean and unclean beasts. The second thing is the doubting, the questioning, the interpretation, and now is about to come the application. And you know what happens? He goes to Cornelius' house, and Cornelius has gathered everybody there, and it's so good. you got to read it. 10 and 11, Acts 10 and 11. I, I want to read it so bad. I even printed it in my notes knowing that I can't, I don't have time to read it just in case I slipped. And what happens? He preaches to them, and he's not presumptuous. He says, he gets there and he says, why did you call for me? I love that. He's not presumptuous. He doesn't just go, where's my, uh, you know, where's my green room? Where's my platform? He says, why did you call for me? And they explain to him in detail why he called. And he begins to preach the gospel to them. And while he is yet speaking, the Holy Ghost falls on them and they're filled with the Spirit, and speak with other tongues. This has to be blowing this Jew's mind. Okay? Are you with me so far? I feel like we're not, I feel like I need to do something different or something. Okay, I'll do it. I want to share two experiences with you. I'm not going to share all the details of, all the, of both the experiences, but I'm going to share enough that I think it will be useful and helpful. You be the judge. See, I like to understand process. If I get to go watch a symphony orchestra in dress rehearsal, or watch the live performance, I'll go to the dress rehearsal. Because I love process. So I want to talk to you a little bit about process. So, I want to talk to you about a day where my wife and I went my wife was pregnant with our second son. That's Josh right here. And, and just so, in case you're, anyone is worried about what I'm about to say, Josh is not sensitive about me telling this story. I already know this. He's my son for 31 years. We're tight. Okay, so don't worry. It's okay. All right? We go to the doctor, and we're there for a 30-week ultrasound, and the gal's doing the ultrasound, and we just want to know boy or girl, right? just assuming everything's good. And she's very quiet during the whole thing. And I remember saying to my wife, I'm like, man, she's like Debbie Downer. What a dour personality. You know. What I didn't know is she was silent because of what she had seen in the ultrasound. And she said, I want you to wait out here in the waiting room for the doctor. Well, I had already been to ultrasounds before. That's not normal process. And I started to go, hmm. And then a few minutes later, they called us in. And our doctor, who had delivered our first son, he said, he looked at me and he said, I'm glad you came with her today. And I can remember. It's like something hit me in the forehead right here. 
It was like something, fear hit me in the forehead like a tangible object. I could like feel it. Boom. And what they discovered through ultrasound is that uh, the ventricles, which are the open chambers inside your brain, these little slits, open cavities inside your brain, and inside those, in that inner wall of the brain is where the cerebrospinal fluid is produced in the in, in midbrain, in the inside of the brain. And normally, that fluid can flow out and go down and coat the spinal cord and all of that. And uh, Josh's condition, there was a blockage of that fluid from going out. And so it was continuing to produce, but there was no place for it to go. So the ventricles, which is what they saw in the ultrasound, were hugely uh, expanded. They saw, they saw dark chambers in the midbrain, big ones. And so he told us that, and he said, I want to send you to a specialist, a perinatologist. And I said, when? He said, tomorrow. And I'm like, whoa. And so the next day we went to the perinatologist, and not a technician, but now the MD did an hour-long ultrasound on my wife. And he got done, and he was whispering to the technician, and he called us in his, into his office, and he was very serious, very somber. And we were, how old? She was 30. I was a little younger. Just leave it alone. I was in my 20s with a little boy. And the doctor said, well, the reason he has hydrocephalus, which is what that's called, is because he also has spina bifida. And the spina bifida causes the hydrocephalus. And he said, and I said, so will he live? And he said, usually yes. There was no enthusiasm whatsoever. And he's looked at me across from the desk, and I'm 27 or 8, and he says, your child could be, this is the wording he used 32 years ago, profoundly retarded, spastic, quadriplegic. And it was an absolute gut kick. We thought they were going to say the shadows were wrong yesterday and everything's okay. But it was worse, way worse. And so he said to me, I guess we didn't say anything. And he said, do you understand me? And I said, yes, unfortunately, I think I do. And we left, and we were devastated is not an exaggeration. And we were heading home, and my dad was my pastor, and I said to my wife, I want to go to mom and dad's house. And my wife's initial reaction, as anyone's might have been, she's like, oh, I, don't, I don't want to talk to anyone right now. And I said, no, I feel like we should go to mom and dad's house. She agreed. We went there, and by chance, there was another minister there, who was speaking in our church at that time and was staying with them, lady. And I came in that, we came in the house and they said, well, tell us what's happening. I could, I could barely speak and I'm not really like a super, super emotive person. I could barely speak. I was sobbing so hard. I could barely get out the words, sobbing. And the lady sitting in the corner, the minister, and I think somewhere along the way, and you'll, this will make more sense in a second, somewhere along the way, more of the family gathered. The lady said, I think we should pray for Lisa and the baby. And I'm thinking to myself, duh. Like this is a pastor's house, right? And like, I was thinking that, and she said, no, I mean right now. And that was the key. Because we might have just prayed about it. You know, I don't know what might have happened, but 
And we had sent the kids out of the, there, was some of the, there were some children, little children in the room, and we had sent them in the back room because Uncle David was sobbing his head off, giving this horrible diagnosis. And we, had, we just didn't want them in the room at the time. And we gathered around Lisa. I got on my knees. I put my arms around her belly. And all I can tell you, all I can tell you is that I cried out to God like I had never cried out before. And I didn't have to try hard. It came up out of me like a volcano. And there's no way that I could communicate to you what happened next. Not because it was some tangible thing, because then that would be easy to communicate. It was an intangible thing that happened. I was absolutely heartbroken and devastated when I walked in that house. And I called for the Lord to come. I, I, I was bold. I said, God, we need you. We need you here. We don't need you somewhere. We need you here right now. And all I can tell you is he came. And somewhere during the next four hours, something came over that house of the Spirit of God. And more family members came. I'm the youngest of five siblings. They all were married, and I don't know, most of them had children. And Pretty soon there's a house full of people and they called my sister who lived in Orlando and have the phone just sitting there so she can listen to what's happening in the room. My little Southern Baptist grandmother who taught taught Sunday school at the Baptist church at one point with all the rest of us were laying on our faces on the floor in the house. No one speaking. My little grandma, Southern Baptist, on her face. And what ensued for the next four hours, I don't even know. I do remember people were wiping my nose for me. Literally, coming up, and I was talking at times, at different times, different people, and they would, somebody came up and wiped my nose where I didn't know, didn't care, wasn't aware, and I'm usually pretty aware. As you can see. <laughs> and I went from the lowest place maybe that I'd ever been that a few hours ago. And to the point I was literally walking around the room like marching with my legs high in the air with my hands raised like a victor. Say, what happened, David? David. My perspective changed. Say, well, did your son get healed? No, he did not. But you know what I believe happened? It was a transitional moment in my life. And you say, well, what good was it, David, other than to feel good for a second and to have a story to tell? I'll tell you what. I think that it empowered me for the journey that is now 31 years in. The Spirit said, eat something, for the journey is long. And God gave me and my wife and our family what we needed in those moments in order to make the journey. Are you with me? That's one experience. Will, I think you were alluding to this the other night. You were talking about the the sort of categories that trigger, if I can say it that way, these kinds of experiences. And let me just say this. I am not, I do not seek experiences. I believe in experiences, but I don't seek them. I seek God. You don't know what experience you need. God does. Sometimes you need heavens that are brass. Can I get an Amen. Because when heavens are brass, you might knock a little harder. And maybe that's what we need to do. So let me tell you another experience that I had. So what was the key of that experience? It was desperation. 
It was desperation. This next experience happened many years ago. And I was, let me back up and say this. A pastor friend of mine taught me a very, very important principle that's been important for me anyway. He said, when the Spirit highlights something to you, maybe it's in the reading of Scripture, maybe it's you're driving down the road and you hear something inwardly, when the Spirit highlights something to you, stick with that thing until it yields up what God has for you in that thing. See, sometimes as pastors, teachers, whatever, God speaks something to you from the scripture and you go look up some Greek and Hebrew and you don't get anything and you just shut it down and I'll come back to it. And you never come back to it because it's gone. And I learned something from him that when, when you feel the spirit, you feel the inspiration of the spirit on a particular thing, stick with that until it yields up. Got to move quickly. It, frankly, it is. It didn't come from me, but it's coming from me right now. So I had been sticking with a passage in the scripture that arrested me. What was the past, past, passage? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. It was for me. That, that is, there's no secret in that passage, right? So I had been meditating focused meditation for a period of a couple of days. In fact, you say, how do you know, David? Because my wife's parents invited us over for dinner, and I, I didn't want to be antisocial and not go, but I also didn't want to talk to anybody because I was meditating upon this thing for two days. And so I came in, I said hello, I grabbed a Reader's Digest book off the bookshelf and sat down and on the corner of the couch and started looking at it. It was probably upside down. I don't even know. I wasn't even reading it. But I knew if I just hold, held a book open, people would leave me alone and wouldn't talk to me, and that's what happened. So I didn't have to talk very much. And then I was, this is back in the days of cassette tapes. Anyone, young people know what a cassette tape is? Go to a museum. There are these little things, <laughs> holes in them. Anyway, I was duplicating tapes. It was the most mundane, awful work. I think I got like $8 an hour. I had, you know, children. It was bad. And... But I'm, while I'm, you know, the good thing about duplicating tapes is it's mindless work. And so I was staying with this, I was staying with this, I was meditating upon this. And I was there by myself and it was noon, kind of like right now. That's terrible. And, and I, I had a brown bag lunch and I got up to go to the cafeteria to eat my lunch, the kitchen, and listen, listen very carefully for people who like process. There was some little, little wispy thing that I could sense that said, don't eat right now. It was the most faint, vapor-like impression. And I said, I don't think I'm going to eat right now. And I put my brown bag down and I started walking around the cassette tape production room and I began to pray. No clue. No clue. Just started to pray. Started to pray in the Spirit. That's acceptable language for speaking in tongues. I started praying in tongues and just walking around. And I began to hear, Dave, I began to hear like, like there was a sound I could hear that was off in the distance. And I couldn't hear it. My uncle used to have a shortwave radio when I was a kid, and I loved to sit down by that and he would show him, he'd say, I've, I've heard Russian submarines. And he lived in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and he's like, I've heard Russian submarines in, in the deep ocean on this radio right now. And that fascinated me. And it was like that. It was like there was something coming from heaven, but I couldn't hear what it, I couldn't quite. And I was trying for all I was worth, all I knew, to dial into that frequency that was coming from the heavens. And I sat down, there was a table here, and I sat down in the chair, and I put my arm on the chair, and I closed my eyes, and I was straining with every cell of my body to hear that sound. And then I was no longer aware of the external. I wasn't asleep. 
I wasn't dreaming. I was awake. But I was unaware of what was happening. And I began to have a three-phase revelatory encounter. Say, so what do you mean three-phase? They were each one was of a different nature. Say, so, well, what did you learn? This is the part where I'm not sure if I'm supposed to tell you anything or not about what I actually experienced. I don't think so. I'm not sure, so I think, no. But what I can tell you is that I obeyed this subtle impression not to eat and to begin to pray. And I was trying my hardest to hear this message that was coming from heaven. Acts, uh, Acts 17.27 says this, that they should seek God if perhaps they might feel around for him. Though he is not far from each one of us. And that's what I was doing, I think. I was simply trying to feel around in the spirit. I had never experienced anything remotely like this before. Never. Wasn't expecting it, wasn't looking for it. In fact, after it was all done, I didn't know what had happened. I was like Peter. I was doubting what this should mean. I came home. I'll go back to the story in a second, but I came home. My wife, remember, my wife was sitting on the couch reading. I came home and I said, something happened to me out at the church today. She probably just, you know, like the exterminator came or, you know, whatever. And I, she didn't even look up and I said, something happened to me at the church today. And she looked up and, well, what happened? I said, I'm not sure. And I, you know, what I began to do, I, I began to go to the scriptures to see if I could find something similar to what I experienced. I had this experience. I even was able to write, I, I still have my notes from during the experience. I went in and out of it. So I was able to write scribble fashion and go back into the experience. I did not fall into the experience. Rather, there was a gradual altering of my normal state of mind as I leaned into the Spirit. I'll share one part of the experience. This was the second phase. Second phase was vision like, and there was a long hallway before me. And I'm moving down the hallway, and I'm not walking, but I'm, above the, I'm hovering above the ground a little bit, and I'm floating down the hallway. And on either side of the hallway are rooms. They weren't rooms, but that's the best way I can describe them. And I would go up to the, to the doorway, and it was as though there was, like you've been in a museum and there's a rope there, because they don't want you to go in the room. There was a, it was like there was a rope there. And, but I was able to look inside the room, and each one of the rooms, the best way I can describe it to you, because I wasn't able to bring a lot of refined detail of what it was back, but they were glorious dwelling places. So what is that, David? Hard to describe. <laughs> well, you must have read my notes because the voice said to me, in my ha father's house are many mansions. Get this. This is a tour of the mansions. That's what it said to me. And I was in such a state of reverence as though I wouldn't even look up like in, in my heart, I was bowing down and I would not look up and I asked, can I ask some questions? Because, <laughs> you know, it's a tour of the mansions. Like, I, can I ask some questions about these glorious dwelling places? The voice said to me, no, this is only a tour.
But what I came back with is this, an inward knowing that there are glorious dwelling places that I was able to see that we can dwell in that are beyond description. And I want to tell you this, they're not just for after you die. Messed with your theology, but that's okay. I'm not going to tell you about the others because I just don't feel to. Uh, and I began to, it began to like lift. That's the best way I can describe it. I began to become aware again. And I was aware that in my attempts to, to dial into this experience, I was straining every muscle in my body. My jaw was clenched, Tammy. My, my hands were clenched. My l- muscles were clenched. I guess the whole time. And I looked down at my watch when I became aware, and it was now 2.30. It was two and a half hours later. I couldn't believe it. It seemed like 10 minutes. It's two and a half hours later. And you know, I was sore. My body was sore for like the next couple of days because I think in my attempt to dial in, like in my body, I was so tight that I was trying to say, should I, should I do that, David? No. Should I strain like that? No, you should, you should just follow the leading of the Spirit. But sometimes it's a subtle thing. Say, David, what good was that experience? And as I began to look into it, I said, I believe I fell into a trance. I've never had another one, and I'm not trying to have another one. If God wants me to have a trance experience, he can give me that experience. Are you with me? So, well, what good was the experience? I'll tell you what good it was for me. It was as though I was being given a taste of the powers of the age to come, as the scripture refers to. So that I could say, yes, I've, I've tasted. Now, in all frankness, have I been as diligent as I should be? And by the way, what was the, what was the key ingredient of that experience? The first one was desperation. I think the key ingredient was diligence. I had been seeking to understand this thing that the Spirit of God was making real to me from the Scriptures. And as I gave myself wholly to it, that ladder was made available to me. And I was able to ascend into the realm of the heavens and see things that I could, had never seen before that I find hard to describe. Now, Revelation 4 verse 1 says this, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened, was standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me. And a trumpet is significant, it it signifies a message. And And the message from the trumpet that was talking with him said this, Come up here. And if I were to give a title to this message today, it would be, to you and to me. Come up here. And I will show you things which must be hereafter. And it said, and immediately in the next verse, I was in the Spirit. And he goes on to describe many things, a throne set in heaven. You see, Paul wrote to the Corinthians, As it is written, eye has not seen everyone, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things, the things. Remember the very first scripture I read to you said, behold, I do a new thing. The things which God has prepared for them who love him. And the, and the, the original quote that that's from says that wait for him. I'll show you things that you've never seen, you've never thought of, you've never considered if you wait for me, if you love me. And sometimes waiting equals time. You know how they say you spell love, T-I-M-E? Listen, we are living in a transitory time, a transitional time, a, a time of upheaval, a time of great turmoil. Listen, I don't think it's wise for us to sit and hope that something good happens. I don't think that's what God has called us to do. I think he's called us to do the work of climbing the ladder. 
and seeing what his will is in a particular thing. Are you hearing me? I'm almost done. You can relax. I don't think that we should just sit and watch and hope that somebody does something. I think what we need to do is we need to hear the trumpet that is sending a message to us. Listen, it's sounding in the earth right now, everyone. The trumpet is sounding in the earth right now. Do you hear it? Do you hear the message? The message that is sounding loud and clear is, come up here, and you might have to sacrifice something in order to do it. I used to tell my students, I need you to, and they would go, pay attention. I need you to pay attention. And I took my wallet out for emphasis because it cost something to pay attention. It cost something to give ourselves to the life of an invisible reality of the heavenlies when the natural realm is clamoring for us. The confusion and, and the, 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 the uh, political football game that's going on and all of the things that are happening in the earth to draw us away from anything that would take us into the heavens and that would give us strategy like it gave Peter to bring the message, the gospel, to a whole new people that he never could have imagined before. His eye had never seen it. His ears had never heard it. It had never entered into his heart that when he went to the household of Cornelius and preached the gospel to them, that the Holy Ghost was going to fall on them just as it had them. He had no idea, but because he went up on the housetop to pray when they weren't ready to eat lunch yet. And God knew in his own divine wisdom and providence that there needed to be a divine intersection at that moment. And I'm wondering if there's a divine intersection that God has for you in your life that you are going to miss if we don't pay some attention to the heavenlies. Pay attention to the trumpet that's sounding. Say, David, you're kind of loud. You know what? It's because I'm a trumpet player. I'm a... <laughs> Literally, some of you know that I played the physical brass trumpet since I was 10 years old. And there's a prophetic, whether it's for you or not, I know it for me. There's a prophetic something in the, the choosing of the instrument that I did when I was 10 years old that God was God to say, David, I've got you in this earth and my... my purpose for you is to sound a message, to sound a trumpet in the hearing of people that will send a clarion call, a clear message as to what the heavens are saying. And I declare to you by the word of the Lord that the, the trumpet is sounding this morning saying, come up here, come up here, stop fooling around, stop being distracted. I got to go to my other pocket for that. You know, if I'd wanted to get all weird, I could have talked about the gate of heaven being a portal, you know, because people like that kind of, you know, I kind of like it myself, but people, you know, weird people, weird spiritual people like portal, so I try to stay away from it. But you know what? There are portals to other places too. There are gates. And I'm not talking about to something necessarily blatantly evil. I'm just talking about anything that will keep them, ha, 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 from turning to the Lord. Here, Bill Gates. Here, here's an idea. Put one in everyone's pocket. And they can literally access anything and everything on the planet at any time. Oh, the Spirit is, is speaking clearly. Say, David, does that include you? Oh, absolutely. I'm totally wiped out by this thing sometimes. Because sometimes what I forgot to mention is when I wake up, sometimes the first thing that happens is this. Anybody with me? I'm confessing right now in front of you. Anybody with me? Anybody go right to your phone? Anybody? I do sometimes, but the Lord is teaching me. But there's a message that he's saying, David, I want you to come up here. I've got things to show you. Say, so what, what is it, Lord? Don't worry about it, David. Just come up here, and then we'll talk. But there's a price to pay. There's some things to resist.
What if the world needs us, everyone? Listen, and I'm almost done. What if the world needs you? What if God wants to show you something that will intersect with somebody else, and in that intersection, God will bring something into the earth that has never been seen or heard or entered into anyone's heart before? What if it's you? Say, God won't use me. He'll only use big shot famous people. That's a lie. You ever heard of Cornelius before this? Hmm? He, you know what he was doing? He was just being, being accountable and being uh, uh, faithful to what he knew to do until somebody could come and preach the gospel to him. And because of it, he received the honor of being the first Gentile house to have the gospel preached to them. And the Holy Ghost, they didn't bother getting them saved first or baptized in water first. They messed up somebody's theology and the Holy Ghost fell on them because he was faithful in the little things. I can't get y'all to come with me, so. No, you're with me. I know you're with me. Do you hear the word? Do you hear the sound of the trumpet? Listen to this. I'll close with this, I think. This is a strange scripture from Ezekiel, from the, in, in the New King James. So I sought for a man. That's what I'm talking about. Oh, there's so many scriptures going through my mind right now to support that phrase right there. Do you know that God has a radar and he's searching the whole earth to see if there was any that do understand and seek him? Is there anyone? God's got a radar, everybody, and it's, going, it's covering over your house. Hey, he's, got a, he's, got people at the, he's got angels at the radar station, and he's saying, hey, guys, if anybody understands and seeking me, let me know because I'm going to open a portal. I'm going to open a gate. I'm going to open a window, and they're going to be able to see things they've never seen before, but I won't go there. So I sought for a man among them that would make up the wall and stand in the gap. Anybody see any gaps out there? Stand in the gap before me. I sought for a man that would make up and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it. Listen to this. But I found no one. God's saying, I'm looking for somebody to stand and intercede on the behalf of this, where this gap is, to make up this gap, to close the hedge. I'm looking for someone. Is there anyone? Is there anyone? Anyone? But I found no one. Therefore, I have poured out my indignation on them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. And I have recompensed their deeds on their own heads, says the Lord God. Is that not one of the most strange scriptures you've ever seen? God's looking for someone so that he doesn't have to pour out these kinds of judgments and corrections. He's looking for someone to intercede. I wonder if there's anyone in this room who's hearing something this morning, who's hearing something, a, a, a string in your inner being that's being plucked this morning by the word that's going forth. Is there anyone? Is there anyone? If, there, if that's you, then stand to your feet. Don't stand because it's convenient or God may require it of you. Lord, you see us. You know our hearts. You see these standing here, Lord, with me. Lord, I thank, I'm thankful for a room full of people who hear your word this morning, who have heard the clarion call of your heavenly trumpet saying, come up here, who have said, yes, Lord, there's something in me that this resonates with, and I'm standing saying, I'm making a commitment before you and all those standing here to renew my efforts 
to seek you, God. To go up on a housetop to pray. To recognize, God, that you have put a means of access right here available to us in our lowest state to begin to climb. And that, Lord, by the sacrifice of yourself on Calvary, you have made a way. You have torn the middle wall of partition. You have torn the veil that, that kept, out, kept us out from the accessing your living present in the Holy of Holies. You have opened that forever. You have torn open the veil to the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant sits, where your presence manifests. You have said it's wide open and remains open for anyone who will enter. Help us, Lord. There is an onslaught of distraction against us. There is an onslaught of temptation against us. There is an onslaught of complacency that works in our hearts. There is a discouragement that, Lord, I've tried it before and it didn't work and nothing happened and I'm giving up. There's all manner of devices that the enemy has been using to keep us from that place that you have called us. But, Lord, we know that you have given us the victory. By your work on Calvary, you have said what the, the ultimate verdict shall be. And there shall be a people who stand up in the earth representing your name and your nature and your will and we are become the instruments of bringing your will to this earth because we have seen it in the heavens. Lord God, help us to pay the necessary price. Turn up our sensitivity, God. Give us a larger, more far-reaching antenna that can receive the slightest frequency of your voice into our hearing that, Lord, if we will only dial in, we will hear your message. Lord, let this place become a house where this is true. Lord, we're not seeking weird experiences. We're not seeking experiences in order to brag or any such nonsense. Lord, we are simply seeking to know your will and to live in your presence even here on this earth because you have seen fit to give us access. Lord, I thank you for a house that is set and established to declare this word. Thank you, God. Thank you that we can hear such a message. Thank you for Pastor Larry, Lord. Thank you for the wisdom and understanding that you have given him. Thank you for his faithfulness to the vision. Lord, we ask that you bless him right now. That, Lord, you, you strengthen his knees. That, Lord, you hold up his arms. That in the days ahead, when an onset would come against him, God, reach your hand over this way, if you would. Lord, if, if anything comes to be a distraction, to be a hindrance, to come against what you're doing in this hour and in this place, Lord, we come against it in the name of Jesus. We speak that only God's will should be done in this vessel. That, Lord, you would raise him up even as you promised, that you would give him long life, that he would live and not die, that he may declare your works in this earth, God. We speak it prophetically and we speak it in, in confidence, God, that you shall do this. And when the day gets long and, and, and he gets weary, we commit to standing beside. To lifting up his arms, to strengthening him, to encouraging him. To giving him a shot in the arm. To cease criticism or whatever nonsense that's in our minds, God. Something great is happening in this place, and we recognize it, and we cooperate with it. Lord, we thank you for that. In the mighty, mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Pastor. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. But since you're standing, since you're there, just 
give me 60 seconds, 90. Um, no matter what David spoke on t- this morning, or would speak on, I don't know, wasn't going to, but <clears throat> I just felt very strongly last night for a word, a 60-second word that would fit uh, the narrative or the, or the, the line of what he was going to talk about. And, um, and um, just say it like this, because I want to, I'm not trying to add to or take away that was wonderful. I just want to try to be obedient to just to say this. Um, and I'm so glad it fit with the wonderful things you said. Um, sometime yesterday, all of my cable in my house went out. At first, I thought it was the devil. <clears throat> anyway, I'm not going there. But, um, but, I mean, totally. You cannot, you know, Xfinity is X'd out. You know, the whole thing, the whole thing. If you try to fix it, forget it. It doesn't matter. Your stuff is um, not dated. So anyway, so I, so I didn't, so I wasn't able to watch all the stuff that's going to the crazy stuff, the despair, the despair, the despair. So <clears throat> somewhere in the middle of the night, the Lord just really said this. I need to say to you, and I just need to say it strongly as a prophetic word, um, and I'll get to that in just a second, but the despair is, is enormous. And a lot of despair is in the air, and we, we know it not. So this is, a, this is another side of that, of know it not. We're picking up, we're picking up negative signals in the air. Uh, I mean, they're everywhere, my gosh. And, um, and uh, it literally took me uh, a whole day and part of the night not getting any news, not getting anything from the outside to hear God speak to my heart. And he said this to me very clearly, and I want to say it to you. There's great despair in your life. There's great despair in the life of people and this nation, and this earth, is a time of great despair, but I want to encourage you, there's something wonderful about that. The size of your despair is smaller than the magnitude of your destiny. The size of your despair, actually, the despair is actually God speaking that at every spare, a point of despair in your life, there's a tipping point into destiny. Despair always injects itself in front of destiny, and we know it not. And you look at every, in the Old Testament, the New Testament, whether it be Jacob, who he's despairing from his life, and then he meets the angel of the Lord, and he becomes Israel. Whether it was Moses in the Red Sea, and they're despairing for life, and know not that that the Red Sea was going to open, and the promised land was going to come to him. Whether it was David, when they had stolen his wife, and his kitten, and all the rest of his stuff, and pillaged his camp, and he was in despair, within a matter of moments, his destiny, the magnitude of his destiny was so great that he took that whole trial. Uh, uh, invading army and brought them to nothing. And you go all through the scripture uh, and you find that even Jesus in his great despair on the night before his crucifixion, what despair, and he's despaired, it's not a, don't be ashamed of despair, Jesus despaired so much he even said, you know, Father, if it's even possible, I'm despairing, could you let this pass? He was so despairing, he went to his disciples just to get a hug. And they were so despairing themselves, they couldn't even pray with him for one hour. But it wasn't within a day uh, or so, <clears throat> and, and then his ascension to heaven, that his despair could, was the tipping point to the magnitude of his destiny. And we live under that destiny because despair is always a sign from the enemy saying that destiny is at your doorsteps. And I want to prophesy and I want to add uh, and, and say that all that, de- de- listen, there's something in the air, something's going on, something, listen. So Father, I speak to the despair in this room. I speak to the despair in every person's life. I speak to the despair in the life of this nation. I speak to despair like Israel was a despair at the, at the Red Sea, and the army was behind them. They had nowhere to go, and there was a wall of obstruction in front of them. But all you said to them was, uh, to Moses, was tell the people to go forward. And as he put his stick out, despair turned into destiny. And Lord, I believe that the despair that we're in, the despairing moment that we're in, every person in this room, it is a, a, it is a holy tipping point moment. It is a moment when our despair, as big as it is, it has no, is no match for the, for the enormous, uh, wonderful destiny that you have planned for us. It is, only, it is only a mirage. It is only the enemy trying to keep us uh, from the magnitude of our destiny because he knows that despair is absolutely no match for destiny. No match. And so he makes our heart sick. He takes hope 
from us and he takes uh, a forward motion from us and despair becomes our life. And so I speak again over your life. I speak into this, into, the, into this room, into your life, into my life, into our life, into the life of this nation. I do it again because I need to do it again. And I say that despair, as bad as it is, <laughs> the scripture says there is the sound of labor at night and cry, you know, and the birth pains, but in the morning a son is born. For joy comes in the morning. At night there's morning, but there's morning that comes after morning. So the mourning that we're in and the despair that we're in is an indicator that God is about to open a Red Sea, is about to bring uh, in the morning the sound and the cry of something new, that is about to do something fresh, that is about to take you where you've never been before, that is about to break the chains that are upon you. As Paul and Silas were in the bottom of the prison at a despair, they were just one praise away from their destiny. And God moved upon them in that context. So Lord, we declare that and we agree with heaven with that and we agree with what David has said about that, that there is something in the air. There is something happening. There is something that is going on and we know it not. Other than we believe that we have the plan in scripture that it is for our good and our benefit and although again morning is night, at night joy comes in the morning. So Lord, we declare joy in the morning and joy and the destiny of those that are in this room and those that came here this morning and this year and the following months after this year, we thank you, Lord, in this, this tipping point, this transitional point that we're in, that it is of divine intention. It is of divine intention, uh, Lord, to show to show the world, to show us the, the power of God that destiny always trumps despair. Destiny trumps despair. Despair cannot dampen your destiny. Despair will not keep you from your destiny. God is, you may be not faithful, we may not be, but God is always faithful. And he is faithful to us, he's faithful to you, and I want to encourage, as David has already encouraged you in this room, that in this time of uh, many noises and many sounds and, and, and many things in the air and things that we're picking up and things that we're feeling and things that we're going through, that there is a change. There is a change. And that chip and point change is that despair bows its knee to destiny in your life. And so, Lord, we declare destiny. Everyone here, I do, if it's just nothing but one finger or one hand or right or left, just put it up a little bit. And do, we declare with every hand that is raised in this room, we declare and we say, yes, Lord, I'm in on this destiny. I am in, I am in, and I'm ignoring the despair, and I realize that the despair is nothing more than an alarm that something wonderful is about to happen in my life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for this amazing time that we're living in. So amazing that the enemy has said his greatest weapon against us, that is the despair and hopelessness. And despair, which is the evidence, or not, the, of, of, not non-evidence of hope, despair, uh, it, means, it means there's no hope. There, it's, it's a sense of no hope. Despair, at its root cause, the word despair means without hope. We are not without hope. We are not. We hear what David said. We hear what the Spirit is saying. We hear what you're talking to us. And we know that we know that we know that my Redeemer lives. And we know that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. We know that God is ready to do what he promised he would do. He's not a man that should lie. That the son of man that should ever change his mind. Whatever he said, he will do, regardless of the despair in our life and regardless of the times and the seasons that we're living in. So, Lord, we lean in to your faithfulness and we lean into your character and nature that says, in the worst of times, God is about ready to release the best of times. And so we receive the best of times in our life and we declare today, we put a stake in the ground and we declare today with that stake in the ground. What we're feeling is not what is real and not the destiny that you have called us to. What we're feeling is despair and the winds of adversity and a sense of hopelessness that is nothing more than a distraction to keep us from embracing the magnitude of our destiny that is tomorrow and the day after and the week after and the month after. We lean into destiny. We lean into it in Jesus' name. And Lord, we 
thank you. We make that declaration, and everyone in this house, if you want to agree with it, will agree that we will say amen. Lord, amen and amen, 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 amen. Thank you, Lord. Yes.